Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, and on this episode of Jill on Money, we are demystifying what it's like to be the boss. You know, at the end of the day, when I put my head down and I think about work and what's upcoming for work, I always think about the people problems first. We don't operate a utopia. People fight, you know, people snipe at each other at a company. Oh, yeah. Just like any other group of humans. And so that bothers me the most. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. I'm Jill Schlesinger. And today we've got a great treat. I met this young CEO. Well, young compared to me, maybe not young compared to you. Uh, And I had interviewed him on a panel. I was so taken by the fresh approach to how he treated people in his organization and how he views the workplace that I wanted to get him on the program. His name is Che Wong, and he is the CEO of Boxed, B-O-X-E-D, Boxed.com. So let's get right into it. Here's our interview with Che. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Che Wong, welcome to the program. You are the CEO and founder of Boxed. So welcome to the program. We start every show with a very important question. What is your best career or financial decision you've made in your very young life? So I have to say that I kind of cheated on this because I do listen to the podcast. And so I was ready for the question. And so I was thinking about it for quite a while. Um, most folks, because we are a startup and, you know, um, I, I left my job kind of cold turkey years ago um, to start our first startup, uh, before, even before Boxed. So most folks would say, you know, best decision was getting up out of my desk, dropping the mic and throwing up the middle fingers at, at the managers and walking out. Um, and that wasn't it. So that was, that was fun, but, um, I I didn't do that by the way, but it was, it was a fun experience of my life, but I would say the best decision was actually to save a year of runway for myself. Meaning that, um, I had a year of savings in the bank where Mm. I didn't have to modify my lifestyle, didn't have to change the way I went out to eat, didn't have to move apartments for a full year. So I could really give this startup thing a shot. That's great. What's always amazing to me is to consider how many people don't have an adequate emergency reserve fund and how many founders have said to me like, oh man, I made bad decisions because I just didn't have any money. Totally. And, and that could be a big, huge problem if you are entrepreneurial. So a lot of folks, you know, when they quit their jobs to start their own businesses, like even if they raise money, they're like, okay, I have this much runway for my company. Um, but a lot of them don't realize that like your personal runway is just as important in the beginning because when you first found a company, you're kind of like, the parent of that company, of a small child, meaning that if you don't survive, the child's not going to survive either. That changes later on as you get bigger. But in those early days, you're just, your runway is just as important as the company's. So what led you to this place? You went to college. Like, what's your story? Um, so it was a long and winding story. So when my parents first came to the States, we moved to um, Ohio probably had brochures in Taiwan of like, come to beautiful Ohio. You so know? they were born in, they were Taiwanese born. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And they um, come here because they wanted a better life. Yeah. So even before that, it's it's a little bit nuts. And my grandparents on my mother's side, one was Japanese, one was mainland Chinese. and they That's met, a big deal, that yeah, mixed marriage, right? Yeah. And they met in the tail end of World War II. And they all ran off together. Uh, and then years later, they then ran off to Taiwan. So my mom's side of the family is that. My dad's side of the family had been in Taiwan for, for, for many generations. And then when I was about uh, one and a half, uh, they moved here to the States. And now family reunions are like the UN Security Council. So you have, <laughs> you know, it's just like. <laughs> Do you have certain things that are off to, off limits talking about? Um, you know, they generally, it's funny because even at my wedding, like the first 20, 30 minutes, it was just like icy. It was like silence. I was like, your wow. your wife's family's Japanese. Japanese. So you had their side. You had kind of the, the mainland Chinese folks. You had the Taiwanese folks. Oh, my um, God. And then the alcohol comes out, and then it's like United Colors of Benetton. Oh, it is, this is, yeah. so, isn't that you know, nice? Social lubricant is... Uh, it's a good yeah. thing. <laughs> and then where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to Hopkins for college in, in Baltimore. Uh-huh. And you're not pre-med. I was... I, sometimes you feel like I'm sitting in this econ classes at, at Hopkins, and you get these pre-meds coming in for an easy A, and you're just like, listen, man, you're messing up the curve, okay? <laughs> you know, like, stay out of this class. <laughs> get back to Oregon. Um, but uh, for Hopkins, it was... Um, you know, that that was a little bit of it. But uh, the reality was uh, when we first moved to the States and here's where we can tie it all together. We went from Ohio then to Baltimore for many years. And my mom was a um, making minimum wage uh, across the street from Johns Hopkins University Hospital at this Chinese restaurant as a cashier. And she would always see all these doctors come in and out. And it was always her dream. And she, I remember when she said, you know, your kids are going to go to Hopkins one day. 
Really? And that, yeah. So I always took that as, as I got older, I was like, you know what? Screw this. Like, I can go to Hopkins. And even though I wasn't pre-med, you know, that was a school that I applied to early and, and I got in. And to this day, it's one of the only times I've ever kind of seen my dad cry or, or about to cry. I'm going to uh, cry when, now. Was when, we, when we got in. So, oh, that's yeah, so was, nice. Yeah, meant a lot. That's a great story. Yep. Okay. So you get out of Hopkins. What'd you do? <laughs> I I made them proud by going to teach English in countryside Japan. So oh yeah. wow! So this was uh oh three when I graduated. So you're still kind of in that like post first dot com like post nine eleven kind of downturn. Yep. Um, and at that time, none of the banks uh, were really recruiting at Hopkins. That's kind of changed since then. I remember going to on campus interviews, and you know there was this program where they send you off into the countryside teaching English for for a year or three. And I was like, you know what? Let's go for it. Um, and so how long were you there? I was there for two years. Uh, wow. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was. So it was, what was instructive about that, looking back? Like, what was the most important few lessons that you took from that experience in just managing people and being in a place where you're uncomfortable, potentially? I, I could name three huge life lessons that I learned there. First is that don't ever take kind of uh, being in a position where you can just simply speak the language and speak what's on your mind for granted. After living in countryside Japan where not a lot of folks spoke English and it was a challenge to get, you know, your faucet fixed or to even just order a meal. Uh, coming back to the States, I was like, you know, like I'm on top of the world. I can I can do anything. You know? mm. um, second was not being afraid speaking in front of in front of uh, uh, crowds because I was teaching in a middle school. And there's nothing more frightening than 30 middle schoolers that turn on you. Uh, and so now, like, I'm like, nothing's as bad as that, you know. Um, and then lastly... Don't ever feel like you're wasting your time by taking a chance. So hmm. here's what I mean that by that. After coming back from Japan, taught English, played Duck Duck Goose, you know, traveled over Asia for two years. Most of my other friends were either going to business school at the time or med school or starting to go from analyst to associate. Some were even thinking about where's where's my VP title mm. at, at a big bank. So I was like, oh my gosh, I really wasted two professional years going there. As it turned out, when we started our first company we had uh, just no interest in funding us. But then we had some traction with our first game. Uh, we were developing mobile games for the iPhone at the time. Got How'd you know how to do that? I didn't. So I, I was on the business side of things. I knew how to play games and knew what I liked. Okay. Um, but it started with a bunch of high school friends. Uh -huh. um, when we went to, so we, we couldn't really raise money until we got this inbound from Japan. So there, were, there was an inbound from one of the biggest gaming companies uh, in Japan. So um, they said, our CEO is coming for an investor relations store. Do you want to meet with her? So I said, yes. So we go there. One of our co-founders had quit Goldman, so he had to rebuy his suits because he eBayed all of them. Oh, so we're sitting there across the, this huge table, 10 bankers and five people from the company. We're sitting there and it was just not good, you know, the first few minutes. But then I was like, I know how to break the ice. I speak a little Japanese. And then I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have said that because then they, they'll start to test you. But then we realized that the CEO uh, of that company was not only one of the only founding female CEOs of a, of a public company in Japan, mm. one of the only now baseball team, female baseball team owners in Japan, but one of the only public CEOs that grew up in the town that I taught English at. Oh, yeah. my goodness. That yeah. is a weird coincidence yeah. and fantastic. Yep. And after that, uh, raised our first almost million bucks a few weeks later. Okay. Wait a second. When you got back from Japan, is that the first thing you did? Like, let me go hang out with my guys <laughs> and my boys at the uh, diner in New Jersey <laughs> and joke, figure out, <laughs> write down on the back of the envelope what our, oh, let, let's do this. Like, let's put it with a mobile game. And you're like, all right, I'll do that. You guys do the work and I'll do the business because I look good in a suit. And he does. He's wearing a suit today. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're probably going to listen to this and they're going to like bust my chops all day because that's kind of how it happened. Mm. So we were in a diner in Jersey mm. and I drove by it the other week and I was like, that's the diner where, you know, my entrepreneurial career started. Yes, Route 46 or something. <laughs> okay. So uh, coming back, it's kind of what you said before. My, my parents were like, okay, enough of this teaching English. You know, doctor, banker, lawyer, pick one. And I'm like, well, it's too late to be a doctor. And, you know, it's probably too late to inject myself into an analyst class somewhere mm -hmm. as a bank. So, you know, I took the LSAT and went to law school. Oh, you did? I did so you yeah. actually went to law school. I okay. Did. So went to law school, graduated, started my career on September 15th, 2008. Oh, About, come yeah. on. The day of Lehman Brothers bankruptcy That's filing. That's right. I love that you know it. Yes. Yeah. Nine hours after they collapsed, <laughs> our firm was located in Morgan Stanley's building at that time, so 1585 Broadway. Yeah. 
and Lehman was a block over. Yeah. And so here I am, new suit, new shoes, kind of like today. Yeah. <laughs> you look great. Um, walking to work with thousands of people streaming onto the street. I, I don't know if you remember that scene. Just of course. Like, Grown I adults knew, crying on yes, the street. Just you know. I know people. I know a guy who lost $20 million on that day, and his entire net worth evaporated because he just sat on that Lehman stock yeah. forever, thinking that he was going to get bailed out by somebody. Not yeah. So how long were you a lawyer? I was there for a little over two years. So you do that. You don't, you're never going to stay in that environment. You're, like, too normal. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> to, to a certain extent, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, after about two years, I was like, Time to pull the ripcord. Okay. And that's when you start your app business with your, your homies? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So how long did that app business last? Um, it lasted- How the... long did it take you to burn through that woman's <laughs> million bucks? That's a better question. Uh, that's a very insightful question. Um, so uh, we had almost no funding in the beginning. So if you count that aside, we went from raising that first kind of almost million bucks yeah. um, to Zynga acquiring us in a little under- 11 months. Wait a minute. So yeah. she got bailed out. She yeah. her, she made <laughs> money. Did, right. did you we... ma- you made a few shekels? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so you so... did well. At that point, are you a Zynga employee? Uh, yeah, afterwards. For how long? Uh, we were there for a little under two years again. Did you have any student loan debt at that time? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. From, and did you pay home. it all off? Uh, most of it, because but then the other the rest of it's like one percent, and I was like, you know, this okay, smart so you, money decision, right? Not to, okay, yep. so that's good. Yeah. So you paid off the higher yep. lo- uh, interest, and you put some money in the bank. That's you right. You worked at Zynga. You made a decent salary. Yep. Was it fun? Uh, it was one of the most educational experiences of my life, but it was also one of the most heart-wrenching. Why? Because you go from extreme kind of independence, you know, being your own boss, living the dream, to then work sitting back in an office and working for the man again. And you're mm. like, wait a minute. But uh, well, also to see- What were you see, doing? Um, so we ended up forming uh, their New York mobile gaming studio. So oh. we were just like a factory of, of games. So the heart, heart-wrenching part was, you know, we IPO'd at 10, it went up to 16 bucks, and then within three quarters, we were trading at a dollar eighty-five or something like that. Mm. So- I don't. I never went to business school, but I feel like that was my hard knocks MBA, and I, I realized a, a lot, and I learned so much. Were you able to sell after the IPO, or were your shares tied up? Most of our shares were tied up, uh, and so uh, th- it was really tough to just to see it. You're like, so what? did your you do do that game like my net worth on paper, and you start tracking it, and then all of a sudden it goes the other direction. You're like, I'm never looking at this again. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And so I remember. You know, because, you know, I was running the studio at the time and everyone was on like Yahoo Finance and like, you know, like uh, Google Finance, like refreshing the stock price. And then I, I got up in front of everyone. I was like, next person that I see on Google or Yahoo Finance, it's not going to end well for you. Mm. And then I go back to my desk. I'm like, Google Finance. I'm like, where, <laughs> <laughs> where is it? Where is not it? To. Yeah. It really is hard not to. Yep. I get that. So after the Zynga experience, what happened next? Um, we felt like mobile game developers had this really deep intuition about how mobile customers behaved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so could we take that knowledge and apply it to a, a new and bigger industry? Let's take even a bigger shot. And so co-founders left. We all took some time off and then came back together uh, to make a box. So we wanted to take our mobile knowledge and go after consumer packaged goods and food retail. So what is Boxed? And I'll tell everyone why I fell in love with Che in a second. So Boxed uh, is an online warehouse club. So, you know, you get you take all the big things that you could buy at, you know, Costco, BJ's and Sam's Club, um, except, you know, all the heavy stuff we deliver right to your door two days or less for 90 plus percent of our customers, uh, free shipping for 97 percent of our customers and overnight shipping for 43 percent of our customers across the country. So it's kind of like bringing that warehouse club experience to your pocket. For you, when you first started, the barriers of entry are low, but the barrier for success is kind of high because you are basically competing against Amazon and everyone else. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I look back and I just think, what were we thinking? You know, in a lot of ways, you know, (laughs) geez, I mean, we're a little bit naive, probably a lot of stupid uh, and went after it. And just by sheer luck, I feel like the tailwinds of change within food retail and within consumer packaged goods kind of blew in our favor. Uh, And by year three, year four, and now year five, we're we're at a decent scale in a rapidly changing industry. And And how's that changing? Like if drill down to the consumer, like if I want to get a bunch of paper towels and I go on Amazon Prime and I click, 
how is that different than my experience with box? So on Amazon Prime and Amazon in general, you you don't really get like the large items that you would see in a Costco or BJ's. Mm-hmm. You get bigger ones, but not the full pack size, and a lot of times not the not the real value. Like generally, if you shop with box, we don't lead with price, but you will save money uh, over Amazon mm-hmm. shopping with box on the unit price. We also don't make you kind of build this weird box like Prime Pantry does. You have to add the right amount of stuff, and if you add too much. You get hit with another five ninety nine. You add too little. You're like, oh man, I had to pay shipping on this. Um, so we also don't don't uh, don't ask you to do or play that game. So who are your customers generally speaking? We're a wholesaler, so a large portion of our customers are actually B two B customers. Really? Um, take uh, small to medium sized businesses. It's now in vogue to not only provide coffee but snacks as well. But once you get to like thirty, forty, fifty people in your office, it's unfair to to let the office manager know or, or put it on their plate to go to Costco with their own car and to buy snacks for the company. But you're also too small for, say, a, I don't know, um, uh, a Cisco to come mm-hmm. and cater for you or mm-hmm. a Sodexo. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been a niche for us as well. The other folks are, are folks who don't have the time, the means, or the patience, regular consumers, to go to a warehouse club. Mm. Yeah. I went to, Mark is raising his hand. Uh, Mark, have you ever been to a warehouse club? Never? That's amazing. You, you don't enjoy the lines, Mark? <laughs> I went, oh, listen, I bought a house uh, almost 10 years ago, and I'm like, oh, maybe I should join one of these warehouse clubs. I can't remember which one I used, but one of them, whatever. I was the worst warehouse shopper in the world <laughs> because I literally would go in there and like meander around and be like, oh, oh, yeah, maybe I do need that. Like, I just, it was so bad and overwhelming. But if you are looking at the business going forward, where do you think the growth is derived? Mm, Very good question. So B2B has been a real good growth engine for us. Even if you think about large companies, um, we're starting to to win, go after and win some of those contracts. Even here at CBS, I mean, probably no one asks, but where does the coffee, where does the creamer come from? You know, Mm -hmm. and so absolutely uh, B2B, but also consumers as well, because the CAGR of the entire industry, the the compound annual growth rate of the whole industry is just at a rate where even if we do nothing, we'd grow at a pretty decent clip. You asked something before about like what has changed in those last five years to enable our growth. Well, five years ago, we used to get emails all the time saying, you guys are psychotic. I'm not putting my credit card in a mobile device, Oh, that's... let alone buy grocery on a mobile device. Wow. That was five years ago. But now it's like, it's a no-brainer. Why wouldn't I get my spring water and my paper towels delivered instead of schlepping at home? That That is so interesting. And so you can do it from a desktop, but it's mostly mobile? That's right, yeah. Okay. The majority of our sales come from mobile. So here's how I fell in love with Che. Uh, I was asked to moderate a panel, and who are you friends with, Joe or John? Who is, who uh, is your John. friend? John. Yeah, oh. Joe and John, yeah. Okay, so remember the previous sponsors of the podcast, the guys at Betterment, uh, the CEO and the guy who's head of communications say, oh, we know a guy would be great for this panel. And it was, kinda, it was sort of being like a workplace issue panel. And you came on the panel uh, with another person who's appeared on the pod, Jennifer Fitzgerald of Policy Genius. And it was so interesting and lively. And I was really taken with some of your description about how you have managed some of your workplace issues. And this is why I wanted you to come on this program, not just because you're very sparkling personality, but also because of the way you run your business is different. So how many employees do you have now? If you count fulfillment center folks, we're probably into between four to 500 on any given week. Which is unbelievable. It's huge. And the the fulfillment center people, are they full-time employees or are they uh, contractors? More and more now. So we offer, when you start, as you generally start as a temp, but right there on the cafeteria tables, um, same ones that I dine at, you, you see uh, just the path towards W-2 and what you get uh, if you work hard and you actually become a full-time employee. And that's stock options, benefits, uh, you know, all this other stuff that uh, we- And have. 401k after a certain period of time? Yeah, or not? no. Yeah. Uh, we don't match across the whole board, but you do get uh, the ability to- Yeah, to get yeah. use it. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that you talked about was really trying to manage how the voice of the people who work for you is really important. So would you mind telling the story about the pink tax and how you responded to that? We have a wonderfully robust and wonderfully strong group of women that work at Boxed, very vocal about all sorts of issues, uh, ones that affect them, ones that don't affect them. Mm-hmm. One morning when I was coming to work, I was trying to get to my desk, didn't have my morning coffee yet. And Natasha Meta out there, uh, she's listening to this and she's like, yes, that was me. It stopped me and said, what are we going to do about the pink tax? And I'm like, 
sorry, I, I, I was not this activist at that time where I was like, what are we going to do, Natasha? I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, let me get to my desk and then let's talk about it. But even a lot of women don't know this, but in over 30 states, women are still taxed on fem care products like pads and tampons as if it's a luxury good item, which is nuts. Because, you know, I've passed it through my own BS filter and I was like, okay, if my wife called and said, hey, hon, can you bring home um, some pads on the way home? And if I said, you know, hey, have you seen the GDP report? You know, it's uh, it's it's not that, you know, the economy's not that strong. Uh, but next month, I promise we'll go for the luxury Right. That's goods. a luxury. Item. Yeah, exactly. There's no, you know, she wouldn't let me back in the in the apartment. And Rightly so. so. <laughs> um, and so how come those items are taxed? And in some states, like condoms are not. It just doesn't make sense. And so from that period on, we started this program called Rethink Pink. And so if we have to unfairly collect a sales tax from you as a customer, we'll rebate it back in savings. Because you have to. If you're doing business in that state, that state law, you have to comply with that. Absolutely. So we collect the sales tax, but we give you a discount So as if you're not paying uh, the sales tax out of your own pocket. If there's a pink razor that costs 50% more or sometimes 100% more than a blue razor, we'll also lower the price so it's the same price as a blue razor. And so the women of Vox now fly all over the country testifying in front of state legislatures trying to get the pink tax abolished. And so the most recent one we testified in um, was Nevada. And in the recent election, they, they, they voted it down. So uh, in a good so way. Great. So there's no more pink tax or That's no more tampon awesome. tax in, uh, in Nevada. Oh, that's a good story. Okay. The other thing that you talked about was you have a unique policy about family leave. Can you talk about that? Because that also, I told, I came back here and told that story over and over. So people are like, I want to work there. So why don't you explain what your policy is? So we're trying to scale these as fast as possible, even for, um, you know, leave, maternity and paternity leave. You know, it's unlimited, paid unlimited. You know, here's the great thing when you, when you treat folks like adults, uh, generally there isn't abuse of the programs. Well, that was what was interesting because when I first, when you first talked about that, we had a phone call and you told me this and I'm like, it's unpaid, right? And you said, no, 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 it's paid. And so talk about some of those results when you say to people, take as much time as you need. Now, what have you found? We found that the shortest leave that anyone took, uh, maternity leave, was little over a month. Okay. Um, That's pretty quick. Yeah, that was super, so quick that I was like, you should take more time, you know. Yeah, she's um, like, nah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like, give <laughs> me a head. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I need adult interaction. Um, so, you know, the longest was 10 months. But the, the most common, like the median, yep. what would you say that is? Probably like four to five months or so. And so you're giving these people time off. They're getting their families on track, yep. but they're coming back and you've already invested a lot in them. Do your investors think this is a crazy policy? Yep. <laughs> Do they push no, back on no, you a lot? Uh, quite a bit. Um, what I always tell them is that there's certain things you can't, that, that are not only the right things to do, but also that benefit the company without being a specific line on a P&L. I guess in these respects, you can kind of say, you know, it shows back up in kind of when you recruit folks, getting great talent. Uh, or by not having uh, potentially as much kind of turnover. In, right. I have to imagine ranks. that retention is really good because of this. I treat you nicely so you come back. I hope the folks listening to this don't think, oh, you know, it's just their policy is just to give everyone the, the, the stars and the moon and, and to and to attract folks that way. That's not our policy. Our policy, because we also have strict policies for other stuff. And like so, what? 25% time, for example. Um, so we do not have a policy like a lot of other startups that, you know, like 25% of your time, you can work on your own side project or you can do this or that. And we I don't actually, get that. Yeah, the, <laughs> I'm old, but I don't get that. <laughs> so, you know, we're like, we, we, we pay you to be here. Right. Uh, we love your skill set. You have to focus your professional energies on on this. And you also said like the hours, like you basically said, hey, if everyone in the warehouse has to get in this time, like the rest of the professional staff, like get your butts in your seats by that time. Totally. So it's um, it was a problem where we, where we had kind of the office employees kind of strolling in 15 minutes after they should be, 30 minutes. But the fulfillment center employees, they don't get a pass. No. You get written up if, if you're five, 10 minutes late. A few of those strung together, then, then you won't have a job. When you hire in a warehouse, are you paying $15 an hour? Are you paying whatever the minimum wage is? Like what's your game plan on that? Absolutely not minimum wage. You know, it's very hard to make a living off of minimum wage. So definitely not minimum wage, but it depends on 
now that we have fulfillment centers all over the country, it depends on where you are. So mm -hmm. some you'll start at, you know, 12, 13, others you'll start, uh, you know, elsewhere, but never minimum wage. What is the hardest thing about your job right now? The hardest thing about my job is probably the people aspect. I don't purport to be the the person with all the solutions on how to solve HR issues because, you know, at the end of the day, when I put my head down and I think about work and what's come upcoming for work, I always think about the people problems first. We don't operate a utopia. People fight, you know, people snipe at each other at a company. Oh, yeah. Just like any other group of humans. And so that bothers me the most because if you think about it, it from a, a CEO's perspective, I don't hear about it if someone just made a snarky remark in a meeting. I hear about it when two folks, like if you turn off the lights, they would start shanking each other with their like, you know, kitchen utensils, you know, mm. that at that point is when it bubbles up to me. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to unwind that, you know, it's so hard to fix that. And it that's what grates on me the most, I think. Also, before you go, just talk about how um, you're hiring, how you have a specific rule. Yeah, it's the uh, the <laughs> very specific and very scientific. And yes. Uh, it's the no asshole rule. Ah, uh, very and so, good. And how do we define that? <laughs> so this is not cultural fit rule. We have some really polarizing personalities and interests in the office. So I don't want to be like this culture purveyor. Like, you got to fit into all our culture. A little bit like if you do that too much, it becomes like a cult. Yeah. Um, you know, so. That's um, how you surround yourself with a bunch of white boys you went to high school <laughs> with, which you may have. Yeah. But. So um, we have this no asshole rule with you can differ. Um, you can kind of argue with folks, but you cannot cross the line to being an asshole. And so the way we still try to uh, kind of instill that is that now on the weekends or late at night. So I'm sorry if you're out there and you interview with us, only finalists. So either you are you are the finalist about to get your offer or there's one other person as a finalist. I will talk to you for 15 to 30 minutes just asking about you. Stay away from the resume. I just want to learn about you. And it's interesting what people say because if we had this show and Jill, you just said, Jay, talk about yourself. You got 15 minutes. Go. Most folks have never been asked that. What's not on your resume that I should know about you, Che? Um, oh, man. I'm one of the most boring people there are out I there. I so don't believe that <laughs> at all. Um, between work and family, it doesn't leave a lot of uh, hobbies out there. Um, what is a hobby? Are you still a gamer? Admit it. After working professionally in games... I stopped playing games. Nice. How, how terrible is that? Why is yeah, it terrible? Like, I can't do. I can't. I'm. I. I. I am definitely not of that generation. Although, <laughs> here's a little throwback for you. Okay. Mark, what was a game that you played? Video game. He didn't play video games. He was like stuck in news from the like, oh, from no, the womb. From the womb. <laughs> um, I played Pong. Thank you oh, very much. Wow, okay. That is old school. That right. is old school. That's so, about it, though. Um, on my resume, I'm pretty decent at fantasy football. Not this oh. year, not this year, but are you in a prior Giants years, fan? I am uh, a, a Giants fan, but I am a general New York fan. So I'm not one of those folks that like if I see green, like as in the Jets. You're not a Jets fan. Yeah, I, I'll always root for the New York team. What about your ability to cook? Because you are of Chinese <laughs> and Japanese descent. So it's funny you mention this because. I've been losing a lot of sleep lately because I've been stuck on YouTube, like watching these street food cooking channels. Oh, <laughs> and I'm like, Yeah, I'm like, man, I, I don't know. I, I probably have to like give up my Asian card. So I'm not that good at math. Uh, and I and I'm not like Yan can cook with the walk. And so, you know, I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know, but it fascinates me. So I'm not that great of a cook, but I really enjoy food in general, especially okay. when we travel. Last meal in New York City, what is it going to be if you had your last meal? Oh, I thought meal. last yesterday. I was like, wow, that was a good one. Um, last meal in New York City, I'm sorry, this sounds probably way too posh, so I'd go two things. I'd either go Del Frisco Steak. Um, oh, my God. I'm sorry. That's, that that's, is so boring. It's, it's that's the last like one. That's right up there with yeah. boring. <laughs> take that wreck over to New Jersey. Or, <laughs> Come on back here. Or um, a chopped cheese. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I'd have to think. It would be a really hard decision. Uh, okay. Uh, and what is the best crab place in Baltimore? Best crab place in Baltimore was probably our house. Uh, oh. So one of my best memories growing up was my dad coming home with a six pack of red Budweiser. Didn't give any of it to us, but just, you know, just the memory of that. Um, and just a um, pot of um, uh, of crabs, of blue crab. And they uh, crack them on the table. No, we'd steam them. Oh, he steamed he'd them. He'd steam nice. them, Old Bay seasoning. 
and some of the best memories I had uh, as a oh, child. Oh, that's very nice. Okay, before you go, Che Wong, what was the worst financial or career decision you've ever made? Oh my gosh. I would say the early days was in a vacuum. It was leaving my perfectly wonderful job in 20, 2010 at the height of the recession and to just quit cold turkey to start a video game company. And uh, seemed to work out okay. In the long run. And so I think that's a good lesson for everyone in that if you think about the long run, 10, 20, 30 years, um, generally things uh, turn out okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joe. Thanks so much to Che Wong for appearing today. Boy, it was great to chat with him. Don't forget, we drop new episodes of Jill on Money every Tuesday and Thursday. If you'd like to get on the air with us or you've got a financial question, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Telercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13. And as always, if you need anything else from us, just hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. See you next week.